Joining us now is Elise Hoag. She served as the president of NARAL Pro-Choice America for eight years. She authored The Lie That Binds, a book that offers a comprehensive history of the right-wing anti-abortion movement in America and its ties to white supremacy. Ms. Hoag, thank you for being here tonight. You have made these connections very clearly in your book. It's not one that people think about very clearly, that the, the opposition, the conservative opposition to abortion is not necessarily about religion or conservative values. It's about power. Absolutely. And then more than that, Ali, it is about power of the minority over a rising majority. You have to remember at the time all of these machinations were going on, what was happening? What was the backdrop in American culture? You had the rise of women's liberation. You had the black power movement. You had the, con the pill, the contra con widely available contraception. So sexual liberation, gay rights. It was all threatening the hegemonic grip that the white patriarchy had enjoyed since the beginning of the United States as we know it. And all of that was being threatened in the moment that there was a sort of craven decision to weaponize abortion as the tip of the spear to roll back, roll back decades of social progress. And I think the lesson that we have to learn from that is although they would want us to believe that this leaked decision, should it come to pass, is end game, and they will stop with abortion. Abortion is and always has been a Trojan force for a desperate cling to power by the way, white patriarchy in a country that is rapidly and has been rapidly changing for decades. That's a remarkable thing for a lot of people to think about because one doesn't think about the elimination of Roe v. Wade um, as, as a Trojan horse. They think of that as the end game. They think of that as the capture of, uh, of the whole thing. Tell me what you mean by Trojan horse. What do you believe in this quest for power um, is in danger? Uh, it's an excellent question. And allow me to say, because it's very important, that if it was only abortion, that should be enough, right? Yes. Abortion is fun, a fundamental freedom that has to be embraced by our nation as a core value in order to actually aspire to that promise of democracy, justice, and human empowerment. So, period, right? However, that is not all that they are after. Whether you look at the history, which, we, as you say, we you did a tremendous job, by the way, Ali, in the intro, but we worked very, very hard and assidu assiduously researched in the book, um, or whether you just look at the actual decision and the way it's come down, it is written in such a way that nothing is sacrosanct that all of these rights that we have achieved for groups that lived on the margins of society because they were not written into the Constitution the way white men were, all of those rights are in jeopardy. And let's be clear, one of the things that we have always said is if you don't have the power of the majority with you, and by the way, the legal right to abortion has always been a popular opinion with the majority. Mm -hmm. Free row, when we're came down, and it is today. But when you don't have the power of the majority, what do you do? You result to disinformation, which abortion disinformation predated COVID disinformation mm -hmm. by a lot. They traveled a lot of the same vectors. Voter suppression always goes hand in hand with robbing women of reproductive freedom and court capture. And we may be at the end game of court capture unless we make some radical and dramatic changes, but we are not at the end game of what this court will dismantle in terms of rights of others that they did not recognize in the originalist version of the Constitution. So let's talk about what happens now and how people who are concerned about this motivate decision makers at any level, whether it's in Congress or, or at the court. When you say Abortion should be enough. Like, if there was nothing else, if, if, that, if that were the end game, that should be enough. That's true. But when you add that, that, that extra part about these other things that are not enumerated in the Constitution, which some lawyers say is weak tea, that argument is, is, is strange because there's lots of rights we enjoy that are not enumerated in the Constitution. But when you add all of those things that can be taken away, should that motivate more people who otherwise were not motivated by Roe v. Wade? Should that motivate people who say rights in general are starting to be dismantled across this country and this becomes existential to our democracy? 
Do I wish everybody was motivated by the right to abortion because robbing women and pregnant people of their reproductive autonomy should be enough? Absolutely, I do. However, if that is not your motivation, you should not think you are safe. There is the old adage of they did not come for me and so I did not fight. They are coming for all of us unless you look like them and believe like them. And now they believe with the power of the court that they have it. But what they don't have is the power of the people. They depend on our willingness to believe that we are beaten and to go home. And I will tell you, having been down at the Supreme Court myself last night, I was invigorated by the fact that people are not going home. They are coming out and they will continue to come out, whether it's for abortion funds, whether it's for legislative reform, whether it's for court reform, or whether it's at the polls in November. People are coming out. Elise, thanks for your work. We appreciate it. Thank you for taking time to be with us tonight and to help us understand this. Elise Hogue is the author of the important book, The Lie That Binds. She's the former president of NARAL Pro-Choice America.